So there's several things that you can do to help you spot these. But yes, A number one, you're doing, oh, say he's going to do it ten times or somebody's going to do this eight times. You're doing some action repeatedly. That's a big hint. It's binomial. A lot of times they'll give you a percentage or a probability in it. Or they may say that, you know, uh, they may tell you that the chances of getting stopped at the stoplight are one out of three. That's them telling you the probability of getting stopped is one third. So they're giving you a probability in the problem. That's another big hint that you're on binomial. But, and also the fact that when it says he's going to do it ten, the same action ten times repeatedly, that screams I'm binomial. Then ask yourself, are there only two possible things that can happen in this situation? Because if it's only a two possible situation, you know you're doing binomial. But they're not that bad otherwise. Okay, moving to the next one. We did these last year too. Conditional probability. Okay, if I set a condition on something, what's that mean? Uh, it has to apply to that situation. Yeah. Um, if I tell you you cannot leave class today until you've done ten problems. Basically, like rules to like you have to follow these certain patterns. Yeah, I said I said a certain condition that's something that has to be met for you to know this happening. In our case, we want to do conditional probability. A conditional probability, they're going to say it's a situation where whatever you're finding the probability of has to have a certain characteristic, or what I call a known fact. There has to be some known fact about the situation that they want you to hit. <coughs> okay. If you'll recall, to work these kind of problems, we made probability trees. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So, this is just the starting information. I haven't even asked you a question yet. I just want to get a tree drawn. I'm telling you, 52% of upperclassmen are juniors. Of those, 65% are male. 45% of seniors are female. How would I draw a probability tree of that? Upperclassmen, juniors, and seniors. So you say you want me to do a branch that juniors and seniors. When you do probability trees, you need a different letter to represent every branch. Don't use the same letter twice. J and S is good. Okay, so we're, we, we know we have juniors and seniors, and then what other information of that do, them, do we have about them? Oh, so yeah. Then yes, we can break them down into males and females. Okay. You put your letters at the bottom of each branch. You label the actual branches with the probability they're going to occur. So what was the probability I was going to get a junior? So if there's a 52% chance of getting a junior, what's that mean my probability of getting a senior? 48. Yeah, that's got to be 48. Okay, then go do the males and females. What about, what about juniors? 65 are male. 65% are male, which means? 45% of, so of them, that means 55% are male. That's a basic probability tree. I can now ask you tons of different kinds of questions about this tree. <coughs> so suppose I say to you, uh, just working basic here, <coughs> what is the probability of selecting a senior male? And I also want you to learn to write this in symbols. So this would be the probability of, am I saying they're a senior or they're a male, or am I saying they're a senior and they're male? Senior, senior, and, male. senior and male. So we just write SM, so senior and, in that in math we know that that means multiply. Okay, so you actually then, since it's and, yeah, you just multiply the senior probability, which is 48%, times the male probability, which is 55%. 56.4, okay, thank you. So 
So there would be a 26.4 chance that you would get a senior male. If you'll recall, it actually makes some of these problems easier if you just immediately do that on your tree. If you just immediately multiply all down all the branches and get the probabilities across the bottom. So the probability of a senior male is 36.4. So if I want a senior female, what would I do? You'd have to multiply 48% times 45%, which comes out to be 0.216. So literally multiply down every set of branches. This is going to be 0.182 and 338. So now you know the probability of any of those possible combinations. Okay. You're saying the two bottom ones. These two should add up to the 52%. These two over here on the seniors, two bottom numbers would add up to the 48%. And if I add up all the bottom numbers, 100. that's 100%. All of those would add up to 100%. Because now, suppose I ask you, what's the probability that you just pick a female? I don't care. Add them together. Add what ones together? You're right. Why does that work? Because I would I would add the, the females at the bottom. So 182 plus 0.216. Because what you're saying to females is you're saying you want senior females or you want junior females, don't you? So senior females would be this total at the bottom. Junior females would be that total. Or, says I, add them. <coughs> So yes, you would just add those together and you get 0.398. All right, here comes the fun part. That's basically using the trade. This is where it becomes conditional. What if I tell you or ask you if a male is selected? What is the probability he is a junior? So why is that conditional? What condition am I setting? You're only selecting males. Yeah, I'm, I'm setting the condition. I'm selecting males. So therefore, I want you to common sense this one, and then we'll turn this into a formula. Who would be my successful? Okay, so it would be successful for me to get, I need to know the, I need to know junior males. Who are my total population to pick from? Only males, aren't they? Because I set that condition. So yeah, you'd actually do junior males over males. In symbols though, when we write conditional probability, Y'all know what a vertical line in math means? The word, a vertical line has a certain meaning. It represents a word. <laughs> it means given. A vertical line means given. So what we were actually doing here, we wanted the probability of what? What's this question asking you for the probability of? Your probability is a junior, so you wanted the probability is a junior, given you know what fact about him, that he's a male. So when you write conditional probability, it's a junior given you know you have a male. When every time you do it, it will simply be the probability of both of them on top, divided by the probability of the given information on the bottom. That's how you always work conditional. So I'm sure I asked you somewhere on your journal or something for the formula for conditional probability. So it's the probability in this case of what? On top, it's got to be the probability to be successful. You have to get both things. You have to get A and B. But your total you divide by is always the given facts you have about the situation, which in this case would be B. So that's your normal.
formula, but I'd rather use common sense, made, made sense. So the condition, in this case, the conditions for this, for conditional probability, you have to have a known fact. You have to know something about the situation. In this problem, we knew we had to have males. So that's all there is for conditional probability. But over here is the formula. So let us try. Okay, yeah, I guess that we have reworked it. Okay, so in this case, a junior male was, that's why I like having all my numbers across the bottom of the tree, because a junior male, I can come down here and go, oh, junior male's probability is 0.338. Now, how do I get all my males? Yeah, you have to add up all the possible male groups, which would be all of those probabilities. So 0.338 plus 0.264. So if you combine those, you get, I don't, can just write the final answer down. I don't know what you get, I just write the final answer down. No, no, she's giving me the whole thing. Five, five, six, one, okay. So you got about a 56% chance. Okay, let me, um, conditional probability has a real impact in a lot of places in the real world. You actually see it quite frequently. Um, you actually have some really cool problems. In fact, I had to cut some of them on your assignment, cause it, but there's some really great examples of real world situations of where they use conditional probability. <coughs> um, you have a great question about you know, how do insurance companies know what to charge you? Um, you know, based on whether you're a teen or what age group. You have um, medical testing. How do you know if you get you get tested for say do you have diabetes and it comes back negative? No, you don't. Is there a hundred percent guarantee that that test was accurate? Mm -mm. And it's actually a little scary when you start doing the conditional probabilities of what could it have, what are actually the chances that my diagnosis might be wrong. If you may think only a 2% chance that it's wrong is, no, is very small, but that actually compounds and it changes your probability pretty dramatically. So in this particular one, we have a flu epidemic at a school. 35% of students have the flu. Of those 90, of those who have the flu, 90% have high temp. <coughs> 12, um, but then there's people who don't have the flu, and 12% of those people who don't have the flu, they have some other illness, there's a 12% chance that they have a high temperature. So my question is, what would you draw a tree of? So they're intending for you to do flu and other illnesses. We're not doing the healthy. <coughs> so I should have said I should have said 35% of students who are sick have the flu. Okay, so you have the flu. What's your other branch? Other sickness. Other O. So what goes? What's my percentage here? 35% have the flu, which means 65% have something else. Now, what are we talking about down here? Um, high temp and low high temp? Yeah, so what do you want to call it? H for high. N for normal. L for low, N for normal. L. L. Okay. Wait, isn't that 12% of those who have other illnesses? Okay, 12% of those with other illnesses have high temperatures. So on others, the high, the high temperatures, there's a 12% of those have high temps. 
So the other side would be 88%, yeah. Okay, on the flu side... Oh, okay, 90% of high temp, which means 10% don't. Okay, what's the smart thing to do before you ever start working a problem? Multiply down. multiply down your branches, which I happen to know these numbers. So if you multiply down all your branches, you would have those numbers. Okay, so now here's my somewhat blurred question. If a student with a low temp is tested, what's the probability he or she has the flu? First of all, is this a conditional statement or is this a just a normal probability question? What's the big giveaway that it's often conditional? If, if it won't be an average problem, but it'll be a lot of them. You see if, that's like screaming at you, I'm conditional. Okay, so my question to you is, this side's the probability you want to find. This side's what you know for sure about the situation. So it said, if a student with a low temp is tested, so you're right, we know they're low. And what's it saying they want you to find the probability of? Of the flu. So you want the probability of the flu given you know they have a low temp. So to do that, you have to do the probability of what on top? Uh, people with the flu and the flu. Yeah, flu lows, you got to do both. Probability of all the lows. Okay, so now you can get it out of your tree pretty quick. Flu low is 0.035. And then how do I get all the lows? Yeah, then you add all the lows that you had. And if you crunch that number, you will get 0 0.0577, which means what percentage actually? Oh, 5.77% chance. So if you pull somebody with a, a low temperature, a very small temperature, they have the flu, they must have something else more than likely. All right? Does that ring a bell? I personally think those are the easy ones. Okay, last part. Y'all haven't seen this before. But this is taking your probability and applying it to the real world. This is what people get excited about it. It's called expected value is the math term for it. But um, it's also called fair game theory. How do you know... It started out if you're playing a game, how do you know if it's a fair game or not? Somebody's taking advantage of you or not. And this first example I'm going to do, we're going to do a fair game. That's going to show up on this. When you do these kind of problems, you're going to want to build a box. That's not a very straight box. That's not a very straight box. You're right. I'll do some fixing here in a minute. You've never done this before. Oh, no, these are not box word problems, so. No. Yeah, this is. Hey, you're going to keep track of what's the event you're doing, what do you gain or lose when you do it, and your probability. Okay. We're going to do, this is a dice game. <coughs> I'm going to tell you, if you roll a one, two, or three in my game, you're going to win $10. If you roll a four or a five, you have to pay 30 Just serious gambling here. If you roll a six, 
I wasn't that generous. You only win 25. Okay, my question to you is, is this a fair game? Do you have equal chances of winning or losing? Are you going to lose money if you play overtime? Expected value is all about how much am I going to win or lose if I do this hundreds of times. Or if, if I'm the owner of the game, how much am I winning or losing if I play, let people play my game over and over and over? If you're a casino, you figure out expected value. You know, if people play the slot machines and you know your slot machines pay out a certain percentage of the time, so how much are you gaining or losing as you let them play over a million pulls of the slot machine? Uh, actually, slot machines these days are all computer chip controlled. Um, I actually did a teacher tour thing once and they took us to a casino. And um, actually, the security is very tight. When they put the computer chip in there, which determines um, what percentage it's going to pay back, and it's pro most of the programs that pay back 3 to 5% of the money that's put in them. But when they put that chip in there, they have to have somebody from the State Gaming Commission present when they put the chip in and they put some special tape on it and they ca a casino cannot go change that computer chip that's controlling that slot machine without somebody from the State Gaming Commission there because they do not want the casino suddenly changing the payout amount to something different so they benefit more than what they should. So it's very highly regulated. Oh, thank you.